Hello everyone and welcome to The Spirit Searches. My name is Justin Childress and today we're going to be talking about one of the most controversial chapters within the entire Bible and that is Matthew 24. Now there's a lot of confusion around this chapter and there are a lot of different ways in which people try to interpret it. Some people believe that Matthew 24 is historical, meaning that all the events that Jesus spoke of have already taken place. Others believe that Matthew 24 is future to us, meaning that the events that Jesus spoke of have yet to be fulfilled. However, the purpose of this video is not to try to explain all the different ways that people try to interpret this passage, but rather to give you a simple explanation as to what Jesus was actually talking about. Let's get started. Matthew 24 begins with Jesus departing the temple and telling his disciples of the day when this temple would be destroyed. Matthew 24 verse 1 through 2 says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. From here, Jesus leaves the temple and departs to the Mount of Olives, where his disciples come to him privately and question him further concerning what he had just said about the temple being destroyed. Verse 3 says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when would these things be, and what would be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, according to Mark 13, we know that these disciples were Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And the Bible says that they were asking him questions privately on the Mount of Olives concerning what he had just said about the destruction of the temple. Matthew tells us the disciples asked Jesus, saying, Tell us when would these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now here, when the disciples asked Jesus about the sign of his coming and of the end of the age, they're not asking him about his second coming. These are questions still in reference to the destruction of the temple. This coming that they're speaking of is coming in judgment against Jerusalem. It makes no sense to assume that the disciples are asking Jesus about his second coming when the statement that prompted their questions to begin with was in reference to the destruction of the temple. In regards to the end of the age, the disciples are asking about the end of the old covenant age in which the Jewish temple was paramount. In their minds, if the temple was destroyed, then the Old Covenant age would come to an end and the Messianic age would begin. Now, some Bible translations use the word world here instead of age. However, the Greek word for age is ion and refers to a period of time or an era. So when they asked him about the end of the age, they were asking about the end of the Old Covenant age and not the end of the physical universe. So the disciples were not asking Jesus about his second coming in the end of the physical universe, but about him coming in judgment against Jerusalem in the end of the Old Covenant age. Now, it's important that we keep this in mind moving forward because this gives us the context we need to understand the rest of the chapter. Because if we know that this discussion was prompted by what Jesus said about the destruction of the temple and the questions that the disciples ask are in reference to when this destruction would come, then it's easy for us to understand that nothing that Jesus says afterwards has anything to do with the end of the world or his second coming, but everything to do with the judgment that's coming upon Jerusalem. And we know as a matter of historical fact that this judgment came in AD 70. Uh, historical evidence tells us that Roman armies invaded Jerusalem. They destroyed it, the city, and the temple, and left not one stone upon another, just as Jesus had said. From here, Jesus goes on to tell his disciples about signs and events that they will observe and partake in leading up to the time when Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. It's important that we understand this and that we recognize the fact that Jesus was speaking directly to his disciples. He addresses them directly throughout the Olivet Discourse and tells them of uh, signs and events that they will see leading up to this time of destruction. We need to understand that Jesus is not here referring to us. He's not speaking to us or about a future generation that will witness these things. These are things that his disciples would have uh, seen and partook of themselves. Now, some of the signs that Jesus tells his disciples about 
are false prophets and many being led astray, wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, increased lawlessness, the love of many growing cold, the gospel being proclaimed, and so on. So one of the things that I want to point out here is that just because some of the circumstances that Jesus describes are similar to those in our day does not mean that they're the same. America does not hold a monopoly on biblical prophecy. We need to understand that everything Jesus said was relevant to his original audience, that he was describing signs and events that were going to take place in their lives and that they would have uh, partaken of personally. He was not speaking about us or future generation, but about the generation alive at that time. And we know this uh, based on the way he addresses his disciples. So after Jesus tells his disciples of the signs and events that they're going to observe, he then gives a warning to those who are living in the area that will be affected by this judgment. In verse 15, Jesus says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now Luke's version simplifies this a bit for us. His account says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. So here we see Jesus telling us exactly where this judgment and this destruction is going to take place. In the land of Judea, but more specifically the land of, of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus then goes on to say in verses 17 through 22, let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for, the, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So here we see Jesus telling them what to do when they see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. He tells them to not go back for their coat. He's telling them to leave the city immediately, that these things are going to take place quickly. So when they see this sign, that they are to leave the city immediately. He then expresses pity for pregnant women and for those who have children during this time because he knows how horrible their fate is going to be when this destruction begins. This is why Jesus says what he does in Luke 23, uh, verse 27 through 31. The Bible says, And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Jesus knows that this will be a time of extreme distress and that it will be even more difficult for the women and children involved. And one reason for this is because of the famine that took place during these events. During the time of the Roman Jewish war that Jesus is here prophesying about, the famine in the city of Jerusalem was so bad that the inhabitants actually turned to cannibalism to sustain themselves. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that this famine was so bad, one mother named Mary slew her own infant son, boiled him and cut him in half and ate him. This famine was the result of Roman armies surrounding the city of Jerusalem and cutting off their food supply. This famine, in addition to the devastating violence of war and the rest of the difficulties that, that plagued the inhabitants of Jerusalem at this time, led to Jesus describing it as the Great Tribulation in the passage that I just read. Now, the Jewish historian Josephus, in the same book I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, describes the devastation that he saw firsthand. He says, now, as soon as the army had no more people to slay or to plunder, because there remained none to be the objects of their fury, for they would not have spared any had there remained any other work to be done, Titus Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and temple. But for all the rest of the wall surrounding Jerusalem, 
It was so thoroughly laid, even with the ground, by those that dug it up to the foundation, that there was left nothing to make those that came thither believe it, Jerusalem, had ever been inhabited. This was the end which Jerusalem came to by the madness of, of those that were for innovations, a city otherwise of great magnificence and of mighty fame among all mankind. Now, of course, here Josephus is telling us of the Roman Jewish war that took place in AD 70 that resulted in the destruction of the city and the temple, which is precisely the prediction that Jesus made in the Olivet Discourse. From here, Jesus goes on to speak about cosmic signs and events. In verses 29 through 31, Jesus tells us about a time that will uh, witness the sun and moon being darkened, the sun not giving its light, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, the angels being sent out to gather his elect, and so on and so forth. Starting in verse 29, Jesus says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now in this verse, Jesus is essentially quoting from Isaiah 13, where God pronounces judgment upon Babylon. In Isaiah 13, verses 9, 10, and 13, we read, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light, the sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now we know as a matter of historical fact that Babylon was indeed destroyed in 539 BC, yet there is no record of these cosmic signs and events spoken of having ever taken place. That's because this language is not to be taken literally. This is hyperbole. It's judgment language that God uses in the Old Testament to describe the severity of the pending judgment to come. In Matthew 24, when Jesus does this, he's simply borrowing language from the Old Testament that his Jewish audience would have been familiar with. Essentially, he's using the same language that God used to describe the destruction of Babylon to now describe the destruction of Jerusalem. In verse 30, Jesus says, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Here Jesus is essentially saying that when all these things take place, when you see Jerusalem destroyed and the temple destroyed, that this will be the sign that the Son of Man has power in heaven just as he claimed to while he was on earth. He then says that when this comes to pass, that the tribes of the earth will mourn, However, the Greek word used here for earth is better translated as land in this case and refers to the land of Israel or the tribes of Israel. He's saying that the tribes of Israel will mourn because of the destruction that's come upon their holy city and their temple. When Jesus says that they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, again, this is not to be taken literally. Jesus, once again, is borrowing language from the Old Testament that his Jewish audience would have been familiar with. The passage he's quoting from is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So when Jesus speaks about himself coming on the clouds of heaven, he's not speaking about a return to earth, but his ascension into heaven, where he'll be seated at the right hand of the Father to receive the power and the glory and the, the kingdom that's been promised to him, as just shown in the verse in Daniel chapter 7. When he quotes this verse in Daniel chapter 7, He's essentially speaking of his vindication as Messiah. He's saying that these things are going to take place in your eyes and I will fulfill this prophecy as the Son of Man. So no, this cloud coming of Jesus is not in reference to a secret rapture event. It's in reference to his ascension into heaven where he'll be seated at the right hand of the Father and be glorified. And this leads us up perfectly to the next verse where Jesus says, 
And he would send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they would gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So first of all, the Greek word used here for angels is angelos, and depending on the context in which it's used can refer to angelic beings or simply human messengers. And in this case, the better translation for the word is actually messengers. So what Jesus is saying here is that when the old covenant age comes to an end and the messianic age begins, as it did when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, that he's going to send out his messengers to gather his elect. Now these messengers are simply preachers and teachers and evangelists, and the elect are those who are going to be saved. So all he's saying is that when these events take place, the worldwide proclamation of the gospel is going to begin. So this has nothing to do with the end of the world or a secret rapture event, but rather the initiation of the worldwide spread of Christianity. Jesus then goes on to tell the parable of the fig tree. Starting in verse 32, he says, From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So here Jesus tells his disciples that all the signs and events that he's spoken of will come to pass before the generation alive at that time passes away. Now the Greek word used here for generation is genea, and when paired with the near demonstrative, always refers to the whole multitude of men living at the same time. So Jesus here is not talking about a future generation or a race of people. He's simply talking about the generation alive during the time of his ministry, that they would be the ones to witness all the things that he had spoken of, including uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And in fact, this generation did witness these things. As a matter of historical fact, we know that Jerusalem and the city was destroyed in AD 70. And this fits perfectly within the time frame given by Jesus for the fulfillment of his prophecies. So we need to get it out of our heads that we are the generation that Jesus was talking about, or that we are the terminal generation, that we're the ones who are going to witness all these things, because that's simply not the case, and there is no biblical foundation to support that claim. In verse 36, Jesus says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So here Jesus has already told his disciples that the things that he's prophesied about will take place within their generation. However, he doesn't disclose to them when exactly these things will take place. So he doesn't give them the exact date. And in fact, Jesus himself says he doesn't have that knowledge that only God the Father knows the exact time frame when these things would take place. He then goes on to compare this day to the days of Noah. He says, starting in verse 37, For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Here Jesus is telling the disciples that this day of judgment upon Jerusalem will be similar to the judgment that came upon the world in Noah's day through the flood, and that it will catch those who are affected by it uh, by surprise. Now of course the disciples wouldn't be caught by surprise because Jesus has already told them that these things are going to take place. But for the city of Jerusalem and the, and the inhabitants thereof, they certainly would be caught off guard when these predictions started to come to pass. In the very next sentence, Jesus says, Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Now the first thing I want to explain here is the Greek word used for taken because a lot of people use this verse in support of a secret rapture event or an overall futuristic approach to the Olivet Discourse. The Greek word used here for taken is paralambano and refers to the removal of people from the earth in judgment or the removal of corruption. 
So when Jesus speaks of one being taken, he's speaking of the wicked being taken. He's speaking of the wicked inhabitants of Jerusalem, the covenant breakers, those who crucified him, and ultimately all of those who rejected him as Messiah, that these would be the ones who were taken off the earth in judgment when this judgment comes upon Jerusalem. He's not talking about the righteous being taken from the earth, but the wicked. And we know this because Jesus compares this day to the days of Noah. And if we read the account of the flood, we see that it was the wicked who were removed or taken from the earth, while Noah and his family, the righteous, were preserved. Throughout the rest of Matthew 24, Jesus admonishes his disciples to stay awake and stay alert, because as he says in verse 44, the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Now, again, as we've already discussed, the disciples were aware that this judgment was coming, but they were not aware as to exactly when it would take place, which is why Jesus gives the admonishment that he does. He's telling them, I'm going to come at a time when it's least expected, so you need to be on guard at all times. The reason for Jesus's admonishment here is to ensure that his disciples stay vigilant in preaching the gospel. Because of the trials and the tribulations that they were going to go through, he knew that it would be easy for them to simply abandon him and abandon what Jesus had called them to do. So Jesus' call here to stay awake was not a perpetual mandate placed upon the church in preparation of a secret rapture event, but it was to ensure that the disciples would stay vigilant in preaching the gospel and not grow weary due to the level of persecution that they had to endure. If you've made it this far through the video, you've definitely heard me allude to the idea that Matthew 24 has already taken place. Now, given the historical evidence that we have of Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed, which, by the way, has not been rebuilt some 2,000 years later, I believe it's safe to conclude that Matthew 24 has already taken place. We know that in AD 70, Roman armies destroyed both the city of Jerusalem and the temple, thus fulfilling the prophecies that Jesus gave during the Olivet Discourse. With that being said, I would challenge you to reconsider any idea that you have that Matthew 24 is yet to be fulfilled, or that Jesus was talking of a secret rapture event, or he had some future generation in mind when he uttered these prophecies. There's simply no biblical foundation or evidence to support this. However, we do have historical evidence to support that these events have already taken place. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something. I hope that I have brought some things to your attention that maybe you hadn't considered before. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.